Welcome to our Common Core Forum. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes? My name is Jennifer Reynolds. I am the creator of Arizona's Against Common Core. I'm just like you. Uh, some people like calling me the chief fighting against Common Core, but I like to think of myself as a mother just like all of you. I found out about Common Core a few years ago when my fourth grade son started bringing home this crazy man. And my husband and I are both engineers, and we were dumbfounded. Why are you doing math in this crazy way? Looking out in nature seeing things like this. Why aren't you using the stacking method, the algorithms that we learned? Because you already know your multiplication tables. He was very frustrated, so I took it to the school level, to the school board level. And then I started following the superintendent who can tell around asking him the questions, because I wasn't getting the answers at the local level. Because of these investigations, I finally realized, you know what? I bet you there's a lot of moms out there like me that don't know a lot about common core too. So not that I started the website, and here we are today. We've had lots of successes. Our membership has grown extensively. Due to our grassroots efforts and testifying the legislature, we had six bills last year, one of which was, went all the way up to the governor's desk. She vetoed it. She said it was redundant and not necessary. It was House Bill 2316. I don't know how protecting student privacy and the future of our children and protecting our state's rights is redundant and not necessary. But, so I wanted to have this event tonight to educate all of you more on the Common Core standards. We have our leading experts in the nation here, Dr. Stotsky, uh, Dr. Milgram, Zia Lorman, and we also have two local candidates who I think are our best solution right now to driving out Common Core from our state. Uh, our Senate President, Andy Biggs, has graciously agreed to be our moderator tonight. I wanted to give a little brief bio on him. I know I'm not going to do justice, so I apologize, Andy, if I've forgotten anything. Uh, Andy Biggs is a native of Arizona, and he's a lawyer. We all kind of groan when we hear the word lawyer, but he's, I would call, a constitutional lawyer. He, has, he can practice law here in Arizona, Washington, and also in New Mexico, and he did uh, practice law in New Mexico for a few years. He served in our House of Representatives. He got interested in politics. I read some of the interesting articles about him on how they were always talking politics as kids. But he joined one of the local uh, district meetings one night and became fascinated by politics, as I did. And that's when he started getting involved. He was elected into the House of Representatives from the state and served for eight years. And he also recently was elected into the Senate. He was chair of the Appropriations Committee, and he was also the vice chairman of the Government Reform and Judiciary Committee. He currently now has, has a position of Senate president, and he's been doing a fabulous job. He's been called the champion of this taxpayer by the Americans for Prosperity, and he's been honored numerous times by the Goldwater Institute for, as a friend of liberty. Many of you don't know, he's authored many books as well, and my most favorite is called The Doctrine of Liberty. So I want to turn the time over to Senate President Andy Biggs. The way this forum is going to run, he's going to be our moderator. We're going to have each one of our speakers, as you look at the biography sheet, we're going to go down the list. He's going to introduce each one of our speakers. They're going to speak for approximately 20 minutes. He's going to introduce the next speaker. We're going to go through all of them, and then at the end, I'm going to be collecting question cards from you. I have a basket on the floor here where I'm going to be walking around collecting question cards. And he's, I'm going to send those up to him, and he's going to moderate, and we're going to try to bring them together, which questions are similar, which ones aren't, and we'll go for it that way. So please, while we're, the other presenters are doing their presentations, please fill out your question cards. That way, when it's time for Q&A, you can already have those filled out. I would really appreciate that. So I now ask you to give a warm welcome to our Common Core speakers tonight, and I'll turn it over to the Senate President today. Well, thank you, Jim, for talking very much, and thank, I appreciate each one of you being here tonight. I'm grateful to see a good crowd. I know it looks like it's going to be stormy outside, and uh, so I hope that everybody will brave the storm and come tonight. So I'm glad to have you here. Uh, I just want to mention a couple of folks here. Uh, we have Senate State Senator Judy Burgess here. She's the transportation chairman. She's come all the way from West Side. So welcome, Judy. <laughs> Secretary of State and gubernatorial candidate Ken Bennett is here with us tonight. Senator State Senator State Senator uh, Senate Majority Leader Thayer Vashore is here. He's, uh, he's waving to me. So <laughs> I'm going to to and then we, of course, have uh, Diane Douglas and Frank Briggs here. And 
I want to just tell you how, I want to remind you of a couple things. Please fill out your questions uh, as, you, uh, as you're listening to the speakers tonight so we can have a good, robust question and answer period uh, after they've made their presentations. The second thing uh, I will do is, and I just did it myself, is if you wouldn't mind putting your uh, cell phones either to off or to vibrate, that would be really helpful. We, uh, in the state legislature, just almost a year ago, we had a, a, a big forum so that we could discuss Common Core. And out of that forum came six bills. Not all of them made it to the finish line, uh, but, but one of them did, and then was vetoed by the government, as, uh, as Jennifer said. And we appreciate all of Jennifer's work and her organization's work over the past year, two, year and a half. And, we, and at that forum that we had uh, about a year ago, Dr. Sandra Stotsky came. And so I want to, uh, we're glad to see her again tonight, and I want to read her bio. Dr. Sandra Stotsky is credited with developing one of the country's strongest sets of academic standards for K-12 students, as well as the strongest academic standards and licensure tests for prospective teachers, while serving as Senior Associate Commissioner in the Massachusetts Department of Education from 1999 to 2003. She is also known nationwide for her in-depth analysis of the problems in Common Core's English language arts standards. Her current research ranges from the deficiencies in teacher preparation programs and teacher licensure tests to the deficiencies in the K-12 reading curriculum and the question of gender bias in the curriculum. She is regularly invited to testify or, or submit to testimony to state boards of education and state, state legislators on bills addressing licensure tests, licensure standards, and common core standards, for example, in Utah, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, South Carolina, and Texas. She ser currently serves on several committees for the International Dyslexia Association and on the advisory board for Pioneer Institute Center for School Reform. She served on the National Validation Committee for the Common Core State Systemic Initiative, on the National Mathematics Advisory Panel, co-authoring its final report as well as two of its task group reports on the Massachusetts Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, and on the steering committee in 2003 through 2004 for the framework for the National Assessment of Educational Progress Reading Assessments for 2009 onward. Dr. Stotsky was also a member of the Common Core Validation Committee who would not sign off on the Common Core Standards. She is also known nationwide for her in-depth analyses of the problems in Common Core's English Language Arts Standards. Please welcome Dr. Stotsky. That sounds better. Very good. I can hear my echo. And then finally, there's a fourth part which just came out a couple of days ago that is on the Breitbart newsletter that details what states can do once there is legislation passed that either re requires revision of Common Core or requires a new set of standards altogether to be developed. And there are some steps that can be taken that will 
in many ways ensure that the right people are on these committees and that we then have a real chance of getting much better standards than a warmed over Common Core version as happens in Indiana. Let me begin first with some of the basic facts which are well known but often still contested. As we know, it was not a state-led process. It was developed by three Washington-based private groups, National Governors Association, Councils of Chief State School Officers, and Achieve, which is a spin-off of the National Governors Association. They were funded for the purpose of developing Common Core standards by a fourth private organization, Bill and Melinda Gates. And so we now have in 45 states a set of copyrighted standards that were developed by four private organizations. They cannot be revised. They have to be used just as they are, and the project itself has ended, so there is no mechanism for even changing them. So even if Arizona changed the name, that was not a change in the substance of the standards. They are still common core. And even if a test doesn't say that it is a common core test, if it is going to address common core's standards, which is what is in existence in Alaska, which has Alaska academic standards, Pennsylvania, which has Pennsylvania academic standards, or Arizona, which has Arizona academic standards, but they're all basically common core, then it will be a common core test. It may just come out from a different company, but it is still going to be a similar kind of test. test. In my fact sheet, I indicate some of the issues with the people who were chosen to be on the three major groups of people involved in the development of the standards. We know very little about why they were chosen, what their charge actually was, what they were paid, because all the records are private. The organizations that developed Common Core were private, so we have, to this day, no way of knowing why all, almost all of the people on the Standards Development Committee that met first and developed this college readiness level standards, why almost all of them were connected to the testing industry. One can guess, but we have no idea why that was a decision made by whom. We suspect that the Gates Foundation and Achieve had a large role in the selection of that committee and the standards writers themselves who were singularly unqualified for the tasks that they were charged with. And their credentials are well known. Why the media never bothered to ask why those particular people were chosen, who chose them specifically, what their charge was, how much they were paid, we still to this day do not know. Then we have the validation committee, which I was on. I will say a little bit about it. Professor Milgram will also make some comments about the validation committee. That was another bizarre committee. We were the two experts, Professor Milgram in mathematics, and I was in the English language arts standards. The rest, we don't know why they necessarily were chosen, but this was a committee of under 30 that was charged with looking at the different drafts of the standards as they emerged and ultimately deciding whether they were internationally benchmarked, research-based, and rigorous, among other things. But those were the main charges. And we were two of the five people who would not sign off because we did not agree that they were rigorous standards. And this is, remains the basic problem with these standards, no matter what else you may hear. It's not an implementation problem only. It is not just because they were developed in Washington and it's not local control, as important as those issues are. They are poor quality standards that do not make us competitive and they damage our public school system. And we don't know whether we'll be able to survive. Let me go very quickly to some of the basic flaws in the English language arts standards. 
my one pager is out there also. First of all, I deal with the missing standards. So if you ever have somebody who says, tell me which standard you don't like in Common Core, this is a dodge because a good part of the problem is what's not there. And so you can't pull out a standard you don't like. There are important standards not there. One on the English language, it's history. There is no standard on British literature aside from the mention of Shakespeare. So there's nothing before Shakespeare, nothing after Shakespeare. There's no standard on authors from the ancient world. And there are some other flaws in the document. The deficits are what I have stressed in almost all my testimony. It stresses writing more than reading. It stresses a, an approach to doing everything that involves far more writing in the classroom than teachers should be spending time on. Now, I say this because we know that writing needs practice, but we also know from 100 years of research that good writers were always good readers, and that if you do not spend time on reading as your priority, you will not develop good writing. For reasons that only David Coleman, who was one of the chief architects, can explain, there is a stress on writing, not reading, and it is particularly inappropriate in the very earliest grades. The second major flaw, which has received a great deal of attention nationally, has been the reduction of literary texts, the study of literary texts, and the increase in the number of so-called informational texts, about 50-50. And what this does ultimately, two negative problems. First, it reduces the opportunities for the development of analytical reading, thinking, and writing, which comes from English teachers spending time helping students learn how to read between the lines of complex literary texts. And it opened the floodgates for something called informational text that we still to this day do not know exactly what it means, but it means that some very peculiar works are being introduced into English classrooms and taking up the time of what should have been quality literary works talk, talk at that time. So we don't have what should have been in the standards an indication of recommended movements, literary periods, even authors. Not specific works, because that's not the work of standards, but something in the middle between students read a lot and students read X, Y, and Z. We wanted standards that would guide a coherent literature curriculum, and it's not there. Finally, the other major problem, which I spent a lot of time trying to correct, were the poorly written standards. They're not fewer, clearer, and deeper, which is a mantra we often hear. Here's an example of what I mean. It's one of Common Core's literature standards in grades 9 and 10, and it asks students to determine a theme or central idea of a text, analyze in detail its development over the course of the text, including how it emerges and is shaped and refined by specific details, semicolon, provide an objective summary of the text. When I presented that as a problematic standard to a group of literary scholars in April at Bloomington, I was told immediately that this was a self-contradictory statement, never mind the other problems with its verbosity. So we have standards, so-called, that need to be unpacked by English teachers. That is a problem we will hear with the math standards as well. They're not well written. Teachers do not know exactly what is expected. They must interpret the standards as they are to use. <coughs> Finally, there is a new problem that I just discovered in working with two historians in the past few weeks on a report that will come out soon from the Pioneer Institute. Most of Common Core's ELA document is about English language arts. It's about 65 pages long. The last eight or nine pages deal with so-called literacy standards for other subjects in the curriculum. 
Here is where the tentacles reach out from the damage that is being done to the English curriculum and actually damage the rest of the curriculum because the standards were written by people who had never taught and who didn't understand a curriculum to begin with. What is the problem with the history, literacy standards? As historians have pointed out, among the major skills that a history teacher at high school level hopes to teach students is a skill for learning contextualization in the approach to a historical document, sourcing, and corroboration. These are not the skills that a literary scholar brings to a literary text. You don't worry about the source of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. You don't worry about corroborating whether or not Jane Austen wrote the work. That is not something you do with a literary text, but it is part of what a history, or histor history teacher or historian does with a historical document. So we have a damaged history curriculum coming from the misapplication of some inappropriate literacy standards. The ones for science may be equally inappropriate, but I haven't looked at those with scientists to find out. So we have a problem up and down the curriculum. I'm going to only briefly mention some of the things now that could be done. And I think I have just a few minutes left, I'm not sure. Eight minutes, okay. <clears throat> if states can at least start to think about how they either stop the funding or curb implementation of common core standards, never mind, at least get them out or get them out, they can think of something that is done in many other countries, having many sets of secondary standards, not just one set. It's not clear at all why we have to have only one set of secondary standards for all students in this country. You can have students who could have an optional accelerated sequence for STEM, an optional accelerated sequence for foreign languages and humanities. Foreign languages have been totally left out of the picture so far. An optional accelerated sequence for performing arts. I have a particular interest in music, and it's being squeezed out of the curriculum. And an accelerated sequence for technical or occupational trades which is one of the most popular, most popular pathways in most other countries for students who do not wish to go on to college, who may not feel that they cannot go on to college or have other reasons for wanting to do other things. And so we have given them no options at the secondary level under Common Core. To have these optional pathways would mean sets of exit exams, which would be appropriate for each pathway, remembering that Common Core is not about getting a high school diploma. People are confused because they think that Common Core is about requirements for a high school diploma. It is not. It is college readiness that is its goal. And college readiness means that if you pass the grade 11 test that's going to come down the pipe soon, you are then qualified for credit bearing coursework in your freshman work year of college, no remedial placement. So that you have a way of doing an end run around high school diploma requirements if the student wishes and if the college accepts the person because they are declared college ready by definition. We need a new testing framework for K-12. There is no reason to accept No Child Left Behind's testing framework or Common Core's, which means everybody gets tested from three to eight every single grade. This is over-testing in my judgment. We should have one or two tests, certainly one at the end of high school, an exit test, 
perhaps one at the end of grade eight, but there isn't any reason why we can't use teacher-made tests for all the rest. That's what our teachers are for. Instead of all the teaching to a test that teachers have not had any opportunity to have input in, let's have teacher-made tests, which we always had years ago, and there are ways to make those even better and more even across different sections of the same course. Probably the most important thing, and this goes back to the work I did in Massachusetts, and this is where I will end my remarks, we need to start with the reform of those who become our teachers. Because no matter how much we spend time on developing good standards, they cannot be taught by teachers who are not capable of teaching to them. And so we need to start raising <laughs> Task Force on Administration's Math, 
Science Initiative and a member of the Achieve ADP High School Mathematics Standards Panel since 2008, Dr. Milgram has been the main mathematics re reviewer for NCTM curriculum focal points. He has given lectures around the world and has been a member of numerous boards and committees including the National Board of Education Sciences, a body created by the Education Sciences Reform Act of 2002 to advise and consult with the Director of the Institute of Education Sciences on agency policies. Dr. Milgram was also a member of the Common Core Validation Committee who would not sign off on the Common Core Standards. Dr. Milgram has written countless articles on the Common Core Standards detailing how these standards will dumb down our students in math by more than two years and will not prepare our students for a career in science, technology, engineering, and math. He has been traveling around the country with Dr. Sandra Stotsky testifying on the problems with the Common Core Math Standards. Please welcome Dr. Milgram. So, uh, so anyway, here, here this thing is, and, and this is this is just to, just to start. Uh, one of the big chief selling points of core standards is that they're national standards, and they're designed so that a large part of the design so that the kid coming from, say, the Philippines uh, and the army base in the Philippines to oh, oh, sir. Okay. <laughs> so coming from an army base in the Philippines can enter a school in North Dakota and just be in the same spot as they were when they left. So, uh, but, but then the minute you do this, the minute you do this, as, 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 as Marilyn points out so dramatically, the minute you do this, you absolutely cancel, you cancel any possibility that there's going to be any acceleration, that any kids will go beyond what the minimum that core standards demands. So keep that in your mind, because this is, oddly enough, only a minor piece of the issue. following charge. 
The first, of our, uh, the first uh, paragraph of the charge was, Re review the processes used to develop the college and career net readiness standards and recommend improvement in the process. Uh, that's that's uh, a very general sort of thing, uh, but, but the key thing is the next one. Validate the sufficiency of the evidence supporting each college and career readiness standard. Each member is asked to determine whether each standard has sufficient evidence to warrant its inclusion. And if not, add any standard that it, that it was not at that time, was not now included in the Common Core State Standards that they feel should be included and provide the following evidence to support this conclusion. Uh, it's just standard evidence. But, but so what we had at that point was authority first to oversee the development of core standards and second, if we were dissatisfied with what they produced, rewrite it ourselves. So this committee was a very strong committee set up to make sure that the writing teams for core standards did a decent job. Okay, evidently as part of this, uh, the charge itself was, in, it was it implied that Common Core was to be, the standards were to be at the same level as the better international expectations. And, uh, it was for college and career readiness. The standards were to match up with what is done internationally. And uh, the, the truth of the matter is that in what, in what follows, I think it will become clear that this was never the intent of the real but hidden leaders of the project. Sandy uh, alluded to uh, these three mysterious groups. Actually, beyond that, there were a bunch of even more mysterious leaders. And I don't think I'll name them, but I think that it will become evident during the course of this lecture that one can find out for oneself what they might have been. So, let's not get around. Uh, being appointed to the validation committee was a very, very big deal. Uh, it was extremely rigorous, and I mean, I don't have a lot of regard for an awful lot that goes on in K-12, but the selection process was as rigorous as any that I've seen in the world of K-12 education, period, over the last 20 years. Uh, it the committee consisted of six state governors and five chief state school officers, and they were the ones that made the final decisions on all the members of the committee in theory. And again, I'll, let me reiterate that the, the duties of the Validation Committee were to entirely oversee the development of the Common Core Standards. None of this is true. <laughs> there's a reality and there's a pretend reality, and we are dealing with the pretend reality. In practice, this is how things actually worked. The first draft in the math, and I'll start, I'll just stay with math because I know something about mathematics. I don't know nearly as much about reading, and Sandy has covered that. that. And so the first draft in math stopped with algebra one, and that was in September of 2009. Uh, remember, let's recall that the intent and promise of Common Core was to prepare students for both the workforce and for college. Just algebra one doesn't begin to accomplish this. Indeed, to my knowledge, no nonprofit college or university, that is to say public, public or, or private elite like Stanford or Princeton, uh, and public universities like Berkeley or University of Arizona, uh, no nonprofit college or university in the country would admit a student with just algebra one background. So I met with the main writer, because after all, I was a member of the Validation Committee and I had all sorts of authority. I met with the main writers and demanded much more mathematics. They were surprisingly non-committal. I mean, I couldn't get a word out of them saying, yes, you're right, we're going to do this. Uh, soon after that, I got a request from, to meet with the number of people that achieve a 
And this is a group that was, in theory, facilitating the project. Um, it appeared that what I had to do in order to get that mathematics in there was to convince these people that achieved who knew marginal amount about the subject uh, that one needs much more than algebra one to be college and career ready. Uh, and I didn't have to, I didn't have to, and indeed I, there was no use even in talking to the people who were called the writers of the document. So this was the first indication I had that things were not as they had seen. So I met with the chief as I had decided, demanding that they, they do much more. I showed them all kinds of data, including the then new report of the National Math Panel, where, where Sandy played a very important role, and what is done in the high achieving countries. But they didn't initially agree. So we were stuck with Algebra 1. So I kept fighting. Finally, after a lot more work, it turned out that they allowed the writers to include geometry and the material for a weak Algebra 2 course, but that was it. Now, incidentally, at this point, let me add this, this common parenthetical comment here. Um, the writers didn't understand that, that, that this was it. They thought that after this enormous effort, they had uh, the, implicit, the implicit authority to go as far as they thought was necessary in producing the math curriculum. And at this point, obviously, I had irritated some people because then the powers that be reacted. Almost immediately, the members of the validation committee received a note indicating a major change had just been made in our charge. We no longer had any authority to request changes in the standards. Wow. Now, this is all, it's very, very hard to get this off the net. It's virtually impossible. So the story I'm telling you now has not been told before, but if there's document, the documentation that you would like, I happen to have every bit of it. I have every single email that went back and forth between the people facilitating the committee and the committee, for example. So we no longer had any authority to request changes. Instead, what we were asked to do was simply to sign a letter asserting, and that's it, asserting, basically, that the standards were excellent. We were given no other choice. We were given no, well, they're, might, they're mediocre. Well, they're pretty good, but they're not excellent. We were given no choice. The only choice we were given was to sign this letter saying the standards were excellent. Well, now you get a problem. I'm not in K-12 education. I don't answer to anybody in that area. I, if I answer to anybody, I answer to the head of my department in, in, in mathematics at Stanford. Since the standards were far from being either excellent or even benchmarked to the level of typical international expectations to say nothing at top level, I simply refused to sign the letter. So did Sam. And uh, the powers that be then made a concerted effort to make it very difficult to find out who were the five out of 29 members of validation that refused to sign off on this at best mediocre document. Now, it's worth noting something here. I was afraid that McCullen would come uh, to this meeting, but I, I didn't see him. Um, but I'm going to actually compliment him. He won't take it as a compliment, but I am. Um, so it was my belief, based on, uh, on, on actual remarks, verbatim remarks of the main writers when they, that they made in 2010, that they actually felt exactly as I did, that the standards were woefully and they were really annoyed when they discovered, this is my belief, they never said this part publicly, but my belief is that they were extremely annoyed when they found out that they could not go beyond that weak algebra two limit. And uh, so let, here's a direct quote from Bill McCallum in January of 2010. It's not what we aspire to or for our children. It's not what we as a nation 
one to set as the final deliverable. I completely agree with that. And we should go beyond that. So this was the real perspective of the one of probably the lead writer of the standards. And the document that he was talking about in January of 2010 is basically, with very small changes, the document that is the final version. Uh, the second lead writer was Jason Zimba. And here's a direct quote from Jason Zimba in March 23rd, 2010. The standards are, and I quote, for the colleges most kids go to, but not for the colleges most parents aspire. What he meant here, a nice way of saying, a subtle way of saying, they're meant for community colleges or for-profit universities. So if you're interested in going to the University of Phoenix or the local community college, hey, these are just for you. So, um, and then he continued. In, in, and was now explicit, they are not for STEM and not for selective colleges or universities. So these are the statements by the, by the actual writers, the lead writers of the standards, their perspective on what they were having to deal with. And uh, this is what, I mean, what, what the document they were talking about at this point, both of them, was a document that was essentially identical, except that the final document was a little weaker than what they were talking about. So again, Zimba pointed out why this is so when he said, the minute, he said, and he repeated this several times, the minimal college-ready student is a student who passed Algebra 2. But hey, in my, with my efforts, we got from Algebra 1 to Algebra 2. So, uh, if I hadn't been so determined, uh, I think they would have never changed the algebra one. They would have never added to it. And we wouldn't have even been able to say this. Now, I can't, I can't say that algebra two is, uh, I can't say that it's a very good level for college entry. Uh, maybe we could do a little bit uh, of data. I've avoided doing that. I, I find that people really turn off when they see data. But maybe you'll be interested in this data. So here is the determination of the odds of obtaining a four-year college degree in, in, against the highest mathematics course completed in high school. And the data is for, for 1982 class, 1992 class. And, it, and what I understood is that for the 2002 class, uh, it appears to be similar. And for the 20, uh, 2012 class, uh, although the data is very raw right now, it appears to be even weaker. So, I can't believe this. <laughs> so, okay. So here's the, uh, the students that, that took Algebra 2, their odds, their odds, so if they stopped with Algebra 2, their odds in, 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 in 1992, uh, sorry, in, in 1982, were 46 that they would get a college degree. But already by 1992, it had dropped to 39%. And today, the best estimate is if you complete Algebra 2, you have about a 31 to 33% chance of ever getting a college degree. But if you go, look what happens if you go even one level beyond that. If you go, if you go up to trigonometry, they suddenly jump to 64%, 65%, uh, and 60% in, in 92. And by the time, if you, also, if you take calculus, it's almost a guarantee, 82 and 83%. So, you, I'll leave it to you to decide if Algebra 2 is a proper college readiness level. So, just to emphasize, here we are, let's look again at the that as we go up the stuff. So, and it's also worthwhile seeing what happens, um, what happens across the country, which high schools 
make, make math courses beyond, say, Algebra II most accessible to students. So this gives a pretty good picture of the inherent inequity of, the, of Simba's definition of college readiness. And so here we are. If it, this is by socioeconomic, district socioeconomic a level is what determines this. The highest quintile, 71.6% uh, of, the, of the, the high schools in the country, uh, which are in the richest neighborhoods, have at least calculus as a course. By the time you get down to the lowest quintile, the lowest fifth, is 43% just a little more than half. So, this is what you're dealing with here. Um, you can, you, you, you are not only uh, giving an absolute minimal definition of college readiness, you are virtually guaranteeing that the people most harmed by this definition are the students coming from the poorest districts the kids you would most want to help. Okay. As everybody knows, you pays your money and you takes your choice. <laughs> Thank you. Now, uh, our, next, our next presenter is Zeb Berman, is a visiting scholar with the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Between 2007 and 2009, he served as a senior advisor in the U.S. Department of Education under George W. Bush, and is currently an executive with Monolithic 3D Inc., a Silicon Valley semiconductor startup company. In 2010, he served on the California Academic Content Standards Commission that evaluated the suitability of the Common Core Standards for California. He's the co-author with Dr. Stotsky of the white paper, Common Core Standards Still Don't Make the Grade, published by Pioneer Institute in 2010, along with many other publications about the Common Core Standards and how they will not prepare our students for college nor a career. Please welcome Sir Vernon. Jennifer? Yes. Oh. She's trying to. Thank you. 